Great. All right. Um, remember, just be mindful of the all panelists versus panelists and attendees chat. Okay, it is recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's webinar. Uh, I'm Doug Holbert with Integrated IT Group, and I'm joined by Brandon Chalice, who is uh, Integrated IT Group's uh, Director of SLED and Sales Engineer, uh, as well as Greg Kamer from Ruckus. Uh, he's the Principal Systems Engineer, and he'll be covering today why centralized management and streamlined operations can make your network administration easier uh, than ever before. So uh, before we begin, um, we need to take care of a few housekeeping items, make sure everyone is, is getting connected and that there's no issues here. Um, if you're unable to see anything in your screen, please take the time now to let us know in the chat. Um, just open up that window, send us a message and we'll get that taken care of. Um, we'll also ask in the chat um, in case someone is having trouble hearing us too. So um, yeah, give us just a, uh, a few minutes here and we'll get things started off.
Okay, uh, I think that should do it. Thank you for uh, hanging in there. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we want today to be as interactive as possible. You know, that this the, what we're doing here with these webinars is is for um, our audience. You know, anyone that's looking to learn um, and and keep up to speed with with the new technology and everything. So. Um, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. So please, you know, by by all means, if you have any questions, uh, comments, anything um, that would help us, you know, stay in tune with what your needs are and, and to keep in touch and everything to make sure that we're providing the information that you guys are looking for and that's helpful to you, um, just let us know. So um, please be sure to ask questions any point during the presentation, one of us will get back to you. And if we can't answer the question during the presentation, uh, we'll follow back up with you via email or, or some other uh, way there. So uh, there will also be an opportunity at the end of the webinar for question and answer. Um, so we can, uh, we'll, we'll go through any questions. If, if you don't see or hear your question get answered during uh, the webinar, we'll, we'll get back to you in the end. Um, let's see. We're also happy to announce at the beginning of next month, we will be beginning a quarterly schedule of uh, meetups, webinars, and lunch and learns. Uh, that'll dive into one topic every three months. Um, it's kind of a three-part uh, series uh, that we're calling it. So um, each topic we will do a meetup on, uh, which is a little bit more informal community discussion, a webinar where we cover the topic um, and we're more educating and, and uh, pushing the information. And then the lunch and learn is where we'll actually invite uh, those interested in, in taking it a step further, you know, out with us, um, go out and have lunch or you know, whichever works out for the group that, that we're talking to at the time um, where we actually meet, you know, with, with you guys in person and we can take even a deeper dive at that point, you know, make it a little bit more uh, private and personal for you. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that meetup. Um, look for our emails. If you're not getting our emails, um, the, the marketing emails or any notifications about events that we're doing, um, please let me know and we'll make sure to, uh, to circle back around with you. So. Now to get, help you get acquainted with us, uh, we'd like to provide a quick background on, on Integrated IT Group before we actually get into the topic. Uh, Integrated IT Group is an IT consulting group. Um, been around for about 10 years now. Um, we do a little bit of uh, everything in, in the IT world, um, switching security, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, all the way down to the end user computing and all that. So. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff in between there that I, I won't go into much detail uh, on right now, but if you have any questions or, or if you're uh, interested or have any IT needs, uh, please reach out and let us know. So uh, like I previously stated, I'm Doug Holbert, president uh, at Integrated IT Group, and um, we're, we're looking to provide some information for you here, um, hopefully help you guys make your decisions a little bit easier, and, and we can help you with the technology implementation as well. So. Uh, with that all being said, uh, Greg Kamer with Ruckus, you're up. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Greg Kamer, Principal Systems Engineer with Ruckus Networks. Uh, if you may be wondering what a PSE actually does, uh, if you find out, let me know. Uh, now, in all seriousness, I've got a lot of background in Wi-Fi, switching, and lots of system backgrounds as well. So, so on to the topic. Uh, so what we're really going to address today are some of the customer challenges that you may find in your own environments, right? Manageability is definitely one thing. Uh, so think about IT help desk headaches, um, potentially having network access issues, people uh, perhaps if you're using some kind of radius authentication, you know, if somebody forgets their password or the password expires, they may not be able to get back onto the network so easily without opening a help desk ticket. It can be very manual and time consuming. Also security threats, right? This is a huge part of managing your network and it spans the entire network, whether it's over the air with wireless, whether it's on the wire at port authentication level or something of that nature, but you have all kinds of things that you have to worry about, lack of visibility, devices that you may not know, or maybe you don't want them to have access to your internal private network. Um, password sharing is a huge one. Uh, I remember a story I was told by somebody in, um, in Michigan, a school district, where one of the student's mothers had shared her password with her son so he could get around some of the YouTube filtering that he had. And uh, so being the enterprising young capitalist that he was, he decided to sell the password to his friends for three bucks a pop. And after he made 60 bucks, the network admin caught it and revoked all the logins. So 
good times there, but had they not had some way to see that easily, then they would have never known. Also, the ability to revoke access. Uh, if you use, for example, if you use like a pre-shared key, if you change the key, that affects everybody that's using that network. Uh, if you were to use something like a network policy server or even any type of PEEP where you're using username and password, issue is, is if you go and disable a user account, all those devices are disabled. Think of a scenario where perhaps maybe uh, someone in your organization, you know, their laptop is legit, you know, their iPad is legit, but their Android phone was stolen. Or maybe somebody is surfing content that they shouldn't be. So having the ability to revoke for say, one user, uh, one device of one user, rather than kind of the nuclear option and bombing it all. And also just plain unencrypted data. You know, you've got this stuff going over the air and the way that Wi-Fi works, if it's unencrypted, all I have to do is come in and sniff the traffic and I can take all of that information with me and sell it or just use it to blackmail or however that may work. But then also lastly, the user experience. Part of the issue with getting on a network, right, is they've got to get on. There's got to be some kind of on-ramp. And usually if it's a, it's a PSK, maybe they have to go and get the key from somebody. Uh, maybe you might have some per user key. Uh, either way, there's, there's a little bit of work there. With CloudPath, the nice thing is you actually, if they use, know their username and password, which granted they may not always, but if they do, they can just get on and grab a certificate and that certificate will then authenticate that user. So even if that user forgets their password or their password expires, they can still have access to get in and change it. So what do we deliver? So for end users, they can provision their own devices. Um, they do it once and they're just on. They don't necessarily have to come to you, come to the help desk. You don't necessarily have to go and get third party help for it. It's pretty self-service and that can be for internal users as well as guests. Also with those end users, you can set all kinds of policies for them so that these end users are not getting access or accidentally seeing things they shouldn't see. For the IT departments, it's kind of a one and done thing. You set up your policies and then they just work. You don't necessarily have to go in and tweak it a lot. You do have manageability in terms of seeing who's doing what, what APs they're on, where they are, things of that nature, or even if they're plugging into an ethernet port, making sure that they're getting onto the right network rather than just having some port that has an untagged VLAN that may either be black holed or potentially has access to network resources that you don't want visible to those people. And on the device side, the nice thing is that it will encrypt the wireless traffic. It will ensure that wired users, if they have access, will be able to get where they need to go. Uh, if they don't have access, but you want them to, they can easily onboard those devices as well. And one thing that is unique about CloudPath is that CloudPath actually, excuse me, is vendor neutral. So even though Ruckus makes the software, we support Aruba, uh, old school HP, Cisco, you name it, we probably support it as long as it supports 802.1x. So let's talk about what's wrong with default methods of onboarding. And I, I'd say even not necessarily onboarding, but policy for specifically Wi-Fi in this case. So first of all, you have Mac authentication, which is not as uncommon as I used to think it was. And one of the big issues with Mac auth is that sure, you can go and say only this certain Mac address or these certain Mac addresses part of this list have access to my network. However, the big important thing there is that traffic is not encrypted. I've had numerous customers in the past that I've worked with that had pretty sensitive data, sometimes customer data, even things with social security numbers and credit cards going over the air that was just Mac auth, it wasn't encrypted. Not to mention any type of fines you could get for, for any type of uh, lack of compliance as well. The other thing is, and this is true for Mac auth and a PSK, you can't necessarily associate a user with a device. So that can be a problem, kind of what I was going back to earlier where sure we could find a user and see them logging into a network through some kind of management system. But you may not know that they're using a company issued laptop versus their own um, iPhone to stream Pandora or what have you. You don't have a lot of granularity there. Um, and also there's no upfront device posture. And, and what I mean by posturing, if you don't know, and if you do, forgive me, but basically the posturing will allow you to have some kind of control over the devices getting on your network. So one, one really popular example is saying, say, um, you know, Mrs. Smith is coming into the office and for Christmas, her husband just bought her this brand new uh, Lenovo laptop and she's wanting to get it online. Well, 
maybe before you let her onto your network, you want to know that, hey, she has the most recent virus definitions. She has her Windows firewall turned on. You don't want her to have Wi-Fi sense turned on so that her, her bestie down the street, if she comes in for lunch, she's going to be jumping on that network too, right? You can disable all of those things. But on the other side, on the PSK side, we talked about that already, right? The PSK, and you'll see this often, you may walk into an office or, or something of that nature, where you walk in and you may see like a guest PSK on the wall. It says, have a nice day or welcome to X company. While that will encrypt the traffic over the air, that key is known by everybody. And anybody with just a little bit of know-how can take that key, put into Wireshark, just capture a few frames, and now they can decrypt the traffic for those users. So that's, while it's better than no encryption, it's not better than having the more robust, secure, advanced networking when it comes to using something like 802.1x. So let's do a little bit of terminology and think about these things. So onboarding, it's, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's the on-ramp to your network. What does that look like, right? Is it radius? Is it PSK? Is it open? Is it some kind of whisper hotspot or a redirect, things of that nature? You have your authentication, and that's, you know, am I going to let you open the door, if you will. The authorization is allowing the users to get onto the network, right? So if you think about uh, in 802.11 with the PSK, authentication is always open. Now that if you think of it like a nightclub and you may have the door is open, but there's a bouncer there checking people, if you don't have that right password or certificate or what have you, they're not going to let you through the door. So that would be more of your authorization. Now the accounting while underplayed is actually very, very, very important. What accounting does will give you the ability to know where your users are relative to an access point. Now, it's not gonna tell you that, you know, if they're under AP7, that they're in room 505, not necessarily that, but you will be able to see who's attached to that access point. And even times you can see where people are moving as they move from one AP to another AP to another AP, or even a switch port. So a cute little story I like to tell. I have uh, one of my clients in Michigan is a large K through 12. And they had an issue where a student had come in and started um, writing obscene things on the side of this high school. Well, this customer happened to be a CloudPath customer. And when these students came in, not only did he write this on the high school, but he decided too, he was gonna create a, faith, a Facebook account and put in a threat, a bomb threat for the school. So the thing was though, is when this kid had onboarded, he used his username and password out of Active Directory. And so the admin was able to see that, yes, indeed, this kid is connected and he's on this access point, which is where the video footage was showing them spraying on the wall. And they were able to track him down. When they called security, security was able to go there and found those kids real close. So now for some fun stuff, um, PKI and TLS. So PKI, if you don't know, and if you guys know this, uh, forgive me, maybe a bit of a refresher. And just like Doug said, if you have questions, just ask. Don't worry about interrupting me. I'm totally cool with that. I want to make sure that this is useful for you. So a PKI is a public key infrastructure. Really, all that is, is you can think of it certificate management. That's all it is, right? You'll have your root, your intermediate, and then any certificates that's going to hand out to devices, users, etc. TLS, or transport layer security, uses the certificates from a PKI. So all of your data is in this encrypted tunnel. So it is indeed the most secure way to encrypt Wi-Fi at the moment. Uh, really, it's one of the strongest forms of encryption you can have, whether it's, you know, SSH isn't necessarily certificates, but it does kind of go with that public key, private key type um, encryption scheme. So one thing, uh, this is going to be high level, so I'm gonna get a little geeky here as we go on. Uh, we're gonna go over some certificate basics. There's definitely more study that can happen. And if you have questions, you know, after this, you know, reach out to Doug or Brandon and then have them reach out to me and I'd be happy to get on a call or do some emailing or whatever. I'm a big geek, I like to talk shop, so don't be afraid to use me. So now some fun stuff. We're gonna go into certificate basics. So keep in mind, the certificates are, when it comes to CloudPath, that is kind of the bread and butter of what CloudPath does. So it's good to know how they work. So first of all, you will have a public key and a private key, right? So if you wanna think of a public key and a private key, think of like a lock on a door. And if somehow 
you were able to cut that lock or that key for that lock in half. And you made 20 copies of the top part of the cut, which we will say is the public key. Well, that public key is fine. That's part of the puzzle, but I can't turn that lock until I have that private key. But I only want that private key to go to a certain user, or to a certain device, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing is, at the end of the day, when you start considering, excuse me, how this TLS will work, and when you think on a security basis, if I am able to give a certificate, say, to Brandon, and then I somehow steal that certificate back, including the private key, while it is true that I could decrypt any traffic that's going to him, I wouldn't be able to decrypt traffic going to, uh, to Doug, to Cooper, to Susie, to Jane, right? So while it still can be a risk if it's stolen, at the end of the day, it's not the worst thing because I've only compromised one user, not necessarily a whole entire network. So keep that in mind. These are your keys. They're essential, right? So now in order to have a certificate, you need other information, like a common name. So, um, you know, www.ruckuswireless.com would be a common name. You need an expiration date. One problem when you think of SSH and you think of the public key and the private key, it's encrypted, but they don't necessarily have expiration dates. They can live on forever. Just think about if you ever SSH into a switch or into a controller or to a Linux box or what have you, those things can live forever, right? I've, I've had a pair of switches in my lab that I've used the same key for the last five years. So it's not necessarily as secure, though it is still secure as far as encrypting that data. You're going to have an issuer and, you know, issuers could be like GoDaddy, Microsoft, Google, you name it. Now, one thing about CloudPath is that when in the CloudPath ecosystem, the actual server itself, it is the issuer. So it is the actual PKI and the web server to onboard users. So then you've got your encryption type, uh, SHA-256, 2048, that's generally what you see as the industry standard now. You know, as time goes on, you'll see that get stronger and stronger, but right now that's where we are. And then you'll have other type of information there too. Maybe you have location information, you might have departmental information, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a minimum of information that you need to have to do that. So now we think about what goes into that certificate. If you've ever had or gotten a certificate, excuse me, there will always be what's called a CSR or a certificate signing request. So in that case, that's where you'll have your public key and then any info. So think about like if you use Windows or maybe you've downloaded a third party tool to do a CSR for you, or maybe your networking equipment does it. It's basically, there will be some public key that's generated after you put in some info. You'll hit that and say in Windows, for example, it'll dump it as like an REQ or request. You then go to your PKI, again, it could be GoDaddy, it could be Microsoft, it could be any of these guys, and you give them the CSR, the certificate signing request. Then it takes the info that you put in before, or perhaps it needs more info depending on who's signing it. Then that CA will sign this, the certificate and now you have a whole certificate. So that's where you may, again in Windows, you may get a return, which is the response, and once you put it together, you have your cert whether wildcard or what have you. So one very, very, very important thing when it comes to certificates, and I don't care if this is user-based, device-based, or maybe you're just trying to put, you know, a certificate on a customer-facing website or something like that. There is always a concept of a chain. So that chain, at a minimum, will always be three pieces. You'll have the client or server certificate, you know, www.integratedit.com. Um, then you will have an intermediate CA and the root CA. Always, always, always. If any one of those certificates expires or the chain somehow is broken, that certificate will not be valid. Can it still be used? Of course, right? We've probably all been to, to websites on the internet that you may see the red bar in Chrome or, or, or you may, or I should say IE, or in Chrome it may say, this website is not trusted. Are you sure you want to go here? Very common when you get manufacturer's gear that maybe has a self-signed certificate and you're trying to get onto the web interface to make some configuration changes. So then there's this concept of an all-in-one. So if we go back here for a second, this is technically three different certs, right? You could actually export them out, or perhaps if you do go to GoDaddy or something like that, they'll always have the CA and the root easily downloadable by anybody. The certificate you get yourself. 
However, what you can do, and if you, again, do Windows, my background is a lot of Windows for I got into networking, so forgive me, but the P12 or PFX actually out of Windows is an all-in-one. So that's where you could go and say, for example, when I was younger, I did a lot of work with SharePoint. Well, I could go onto one SharePoint box, one front end, I can make the cert, get it from GoDaddy or Thought or VeriSign, and then if I wanna put it on the other four web servers or other three web servers or what have you, I simply export that certificate as a PFX, which should always have a password. Always, always, always have a password. Because again, this is the entire thing, private key, public key, the roots, intermediate, all of that is there. If that gets out and is not encrypted, you're at risk of being compromised on that server or what have you. So the kind of more industry standard, what you'll see around uh, if you do Linux or, or anything like that's what's called a P12. And that P12, again, is just this all-in-one that you may use on some kind of uh, Linux web server. Perhaps you use it in on a, you know, a, a load balancer or something of that nature. Now, one thing to keep in mind is just a pro tip. If you ever have a PFX or a P12 and you either need to convert them one to the other or you need to break them apart, OpenSSL is your friend. Uh, it comes natively on nine times out of 10, it's on Linux. Mac OS, it's usually there. And then on Windows, you can just install it as well. So some of the PKI protocols. So for certificate issuance, right? So there is the concept of somebody going to a website and getting a certificate. And whether that's buying a public cert or maybe somebody needs a cert in your organization on, in order to get onto Exchange or encrypt traffic back and forth between Exchange and a client or something of that nature, or even Google, right? That's more of a manual way of doing it. There are two other ways of doing it. Uh, one that you see that will happen on, uh, more, more often you see this on Apple devices, but I think it works on Windows too. It's called SCEP. And SCEP is Simple Certificate Enrollment Protocol. And really, uh, nine times out of 10, you'll see this used when somebody's using some kind of mobile device management, like AirWatch or Jamf or Sodi or something of that nature. And basically it takes all the guesswork out when your user needs a certificate to get on the network. They don't actually have to do anything other than connect to a network the first time to pull down that package from the MDM. And from then on, it'll give them the certificate and they can get on your encrypted network. There's a newer one called EST. Um, I am no expert in that. I actually just found it a couple weeks ago when I was doing research for this and haven't had a chance to get too deep on it. Uh, though there is one other one I didn't mention here. And in the Windows world, you have group policy. So um, if you're not a Windows admin, Group policy can be either your best friend or your worst enemy, but as far as it relates here, you can do group policy to set up what's called auto enrollment. So if you have a device on your network that is joined to the Windows domain, it can automatically start pulling certificates out of the PKI, the specifically ADCS or Active Directory Certificate Services, so that they can get access to Wi-Fi, um, to networking resources, to other things of that nature, just depending on how you have it set up. Uh, it's great. It can also bite you in the butt if you don't configure it properly. So now we need certificate validation, right? And validation meaning that the certificate is legit. So, you know, obviously you're gonna have an expiration period, um, but what if you have a certificate that is taken, but it's still not expired? So go back to the example I said a little bit earlier, you know, I've gotten Brandon's certificate off of his laptop, well, what can he do? Because obviously he doesn't want me to get his data. So what he could do and should do is get a new certificate and revoke the old one. So, and that can be a manual process. So you've got two ways to validate your certificates. You've got one, which is CRL or certificate revocation list. Um, fun little fact about CRL, even to this day, if you're on a Windows machine, and I think Mac OS has it too, forgive me, I don't know for sure, but if you're on a Windows machine and you open up your certificate snap-in for MMC, you can look at revoke certificates and you'll see two Microsoft certificates and they expired in I believe 2004 or 2005. And the story about that was there was a gentleman who called into, right, maybe gentleman's too strong of a word, called to Microsoft, claimed he was a contractor and said he needed certificates for his project. And they issued him two certificates, signed by Microsoft, trusted worldwide. Um, they found the error in a few days and then they then revoked them. So, but it was such a potential security breach, they pushed patches to Windows systems, putting those certificates in the CRL for all of them. Now, multi-billion Windows devices on the planet. So that's kind of the old school way. CRL though, is really only a check once kind of thing. There's not a continuing ongoing check. 
So then you have OCSP, which is Online Certificate Service Processing. This is kind of the new way we do these things. And so OCSP is usually basically a timer. And every so often, that certificate itself is going to check with an OCSP provider. Now, every PKI, I shouldn't say every, 99% of them will have their own OCSP listeners. And so for a really good example with CloudPath, when you set it up, it's going to have an OCSP listener and you can set in your policy that if I don't see a device or the certificate come online for say 30 days, 10 days, five days, then go ahead and revoke that cert. So an example of why you may wanna do that, uh, say like a, you have um, handheld tablets or maybe an iPad that your sales force, they, they have one that's assigned to each of them and it has you know, very potentially sensitive data that it can access. It may not live on the device, but they can access it while they're in the network. Well, let's say one of those devices gets stolen. Do we then want that device to be able to get back on the network? No, we don't, we wanna revoke that certificate. So you don't, but you can automate it in the sense that if I don't see this device on the network for 30 days, go ahead and revoke the certificate. Now, one unique thing about CloudPath is that even if you do revoke the certificate, you can unrevoke it. So while that may sound a bit counterintuitive, let me give you another example. Say uh, a school has a, a policy that if they don't see somebody for 60 days, they're gonna revoke their cert. So what happens if say Miss Smith goes on maternity leave, she's had her beautiful baby, she comes back and it's been 70 days, well, her you know, Chromebook or her Windows PC or Mac can't get on the network. Well, rather than her having to necessarily go ahead and re-enroll, she can just simply be unrevoked by a user. So you can actually set policies that if a revoke cert comes onto your network, it can send an email to an admin or to a distribution list or fire off an API or send a text or what have you. So makes it that much simpler. So um, I don't know if, uh, if any of our attendees here are in education, but um, I mean, to be fair, if it's higher ed, there's a couple niche things here, but a lot of these things can be done no matter where you work. So one of the things that CloudPath can do is integrate with third-party web filtering um, as, as well as, as firewalls. And what that can allow you to do is set more granular policies based on say username, group membership, um, SSID, what have you. And so what we can do is we can relay those accounting packets that I was mentioning earlier to these devices or to their software managers or what have you. Uh, also can simplify Chromebook onboarding. Now granted Chromebooks do tend to be more highly used in education, though I am seeing like, for example, one of my customers is Texas Roadhouse. They're using Chromebooks as their office computers now. Uh, everything they're doing is pretty much on the web. So having a Chromebook, which is one low cost and two doesn't really store much data on there is very appealing. So they can not only onboard those, but they can monitor them through CloudPath as well as the Google Cloud. Another thing that's pretty big is the uh, personal VLANs. So, and this isn't really just something that needs to be done for students. It could be in a, in a housing complex, it could be at your house, it could be all kinds of places. So a use case for that would be, so say for example, you're running um, Apple TV or printers or something like that. And in, in kind of an education or MD environment, this makes a lot of sense. So what if I live in dorm three, two, and I have, you know, a, an Xbox and I have a printer and I have a Roku device. Well, what if I want to be able to access my stuff, but I don't want anybody else to access it? Or better yet, maybe I need to go to class and I need to have something printed out, but from class I could print from my laptop and it would still come out on my printer without using something like Google Cloud Print or something like that. That's what personal VLANs can do. And we can do that with CloudPath. Edgerome, more of a niche case, uh, basically, if you don't know, Edgerom is just a, a worldwide roaming network. So that me, for example, I live in Colorado Springs. And if I was attending, you know, one of the colleges here, but I went to Germany to do some kind of uh, study abroad, I could still use my username and password credentials from the university in Colorado. Because again, it's just this big network. And we integrate with, with Edgerom with just a few clicks. And this other thing, it says let students pre-board. Again, this doesn't necessarily have to be students. This could be your own workers. This could be friends. This could be whatever. So the example though, that is most readily available is in education. So I just recently moved to Colorado from Kentucky. And one of my customers in Kentucky was called the University of Pikeville or Pikeville University. Sorry, I always get that messed up. So one thing that they used to struggle with 
is even though they were a small college, they only had about 2,000 students, is on day one, when all the registration would start, they were just getting pounded for new students and even returning students coming in and trying to get onto the network. So instead of doing that, what they decided to do was when the users got their welcome emails, like, you know, the first day of class is August 6th, let's say. When they get that email, it's gonna have a link to allow them to hit the CloudPass server and go ahead and get their devices onboarded or ready, I should say, for the network so that when they arrive on campus, it just works. It's smoother for them, it's smoother for the staff, makes life easier, increases manageability. All right. So, security connectivity for any network. Now again, I have to emphasize, this is a vendor neutral tool, right? Now, to be fair, does Ruckus have some things in there that maybe Aruba or Cisco doesn't? True, it does. But in those types of things, they're usually things that are proprietary to Ruckus. Like one good example is our dynamic pre-shared key technology, where I can take a key and tie it to a MAC address, but it's unique per user. So if I was able to get that key, I couldn't get on. It's only bound to that one user device. So one thing of any network, right, uh, is encryption. Over the air, WPA2 Enterprise, ETLS is the best. Certificates are always the best way to encrypt your network. Now, one question I get often is, well, why are certificates better than say, MS Chat V2 or username and password, PEEP type encryption? The biggest flaw with PEEP, even though it is very secure, I'm not saying it's not secure. The biggest flaw though, is if somebody should get access to the radius server or servers, you're gonna get the public key when you join anyway. However, you don't have the private key, that's on the server. If you get to that server and you take that private key, I can encrypt, unencrypt anybody's traffic on the network because everything is based off of that key pair. So again, it's not necessarily bad to do that, it's just better to do TLS. Then you start getting into other aspects of security like locking down admin access, physical access, things of that nature. You can deny unapproved access. Um, again, it's certificate based. This just goes back to kind of what I was talking about earlier where Susie has three devices, one is taken away. I just wanna turn that one device off. I want her other two legitimate devices to still stay on the network. Policy based access, pretty straightforward uh, through VLANs, rate limiting, time of day access, things of that nature. Um, ensuring the devices are safe. And, and I think you're ensuring devices are safe, but you're also ensuring your network can be safer and upfront postures, like making sure they have antivirus. Um, maybe they need to have some kind of proxy set up so they can go through a, a web filter or something of that nature, all that you can do with CloudPath. But the biggest thing, and I, I'd say arguably one of the best things about CloudPath is that it increases IT control and visibility. Right, so I know we're just doing a webinar and I can't see anybody, but I'd be willing to bet Almost everybody on this call, if I said, do you wish you had more visibility in your network? You'd probably say yes, right? And I'm sure you probably have a good amount. You may have tools, you may have hardware appliances, things of that nature to get some visibility, but nine times out of 10, people always want a little bit more. And that's something that CloudPath can do. So not only can you see the user, you can see their devices, you can see where they're on, you can see how long they've been offline. You know, you can get all kinds of information about this stuff. And I'll, I'll do a quick demo here in a bit and show you what that looks like. So um, here is a, a way in the CloudPath GUI to manage the certificates. You'll notice that the certificate name is here, timestamps expiration with the CA, and again, CA, PKI, almost the same thing. Um, the user, the template, I'll show you all of this, but each one of those is bound to a unique device, right? So like, for example, Mita Gupta here, she has two of these, at least for here, and this, one could be, say for example, uh, an iPhone, the other one is a MacBook. Well, if her iPhone is out of line and we need to kick her off, fine, we can do that, but her MacBook's not gonna be messed up. So just to give you an idea, uh, one of the things that we really pride ourselves with CloudPath is the configuration and custom ability, but it's simple. It's not very hard at all to use. And this is, excuse me, literally what it looks like if you were to go in and take a look at the demo here. These are the workflow steps, right? And each one of those is going to correspond to what it actually looks like to the end user and as far as how it can work. So again, self-service onboarding, the, the most important thing I think to remember based on this is that day one, they're gonna onboard, they're gonna use the policies that you and your team have set up, but on day two, it just works, right? They don't necessarily have to come back to you. 
they're not busy doing other things or having to say, oh crap, you know, it's been seven days, I need to do it again. Now, could you be a benevolent-ish dictator and take a certificate and only give it a seven-day lifespan? Sure, you can. Uh, you can give it a five-minute lifespan if you want. But at the end of the day, most people, well, it is kind of funny to do that a couple times, it grows old, and you just want it to work, right? You have other things you need to knock out, whether that's going and doing, you know, some patching, some maintenance, or maybe some good old gaming. So, but we're all good boys and girls. We would never do that. And I love this slide only because when you start to think of, of Cloud Path and what it can do, it, it's literally like a bunch of Legos, or I think the last time I gave this, somebody called me out and said, those aren't Legos, they're mega blocks. Uh, I don't know what they are, however they interlock, so we'll just call them Legos generically. But you can take these different pieces to do different things and you put them together and make and build whatever you want for your environment. Not only is it gonna increase security, it's gonna increase your management capabilities as well. Now, this slide here is really showing you that while we have some customization, or well, we don't have much customization out of the box, we have kind of our own simple template that we use because this is your forward facing web page for your users, you can customize it to your heart's content, right? This is kind of basically our normal layout, but with different images, different colors, things of that nature. If you wish, you can put your own CSS and HTML templates. I've seen, like for example, we have a, a very well-known F1 racing company that uses CloudPath. And had somebody not told me it was CloudPath, I never would have known. It doesn't look anything like CloudPath looks out of the box. So you can brand this with your own company logo, colors, et cetera, et cetera. So now on the policy management, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that not only can we do it per user, per device, but we can actually filter out different types of OSs. So for example, Windows, but not only Windows, maybe you want Windows 7 to have one policy while Windows 10 has another policy. Um, something I, I hear often from a lot of my customers is iOS, right? Many Wi-Fi vendors will tag iPads and iPhones as iOS because they're both iOS, but how do you know, like maybe you want your iPads to be on this VLAN, but you want your iPhones to be on this other VLAN. CloudPath can do that. And you can set very granular policies, including differentiating employee owned devices versus IT owned or company owned devices, right? So very flexible there. So a couple different access policies you see often, role-based access control, you know, and, and whatever those roles may be. It may be time of day, it may be certain firewall rules. It may be different VLANs, what have you, right? Then bandwidth management. Uh, maybe you say, well, uh, finance, they only get 25 megs over the air, whereas IT just rock and rolls at however fast you can go. You could, but at the end of the day, you have different user experiences, which you can control for the better of your department and your business. So there's also a huge set of APIs within CloudPath that can integrate with third-party systems um, but not just third-party systems, you can write these APIs yourself and, and tie them together. So I have uh, another company that I've been working with that they have a restaurant chain and what they're wanting to do is deploy handhelds in their restaurants. But when that device is onboarded, they want it not only to go through cloud path and the IT systems, but they also want it to go to the restaurant management system so that it, it can keep tabs and do some of its own device management. So basically all this information that CloudPath collects, it then goes and puts into the system for them so they don't have to have any manual entry. But some of these third-party products that we work with natively, uh, we have native first-party integration with Palo Alto Networks. Uh, Google with the Chromebooks, we're also, we were one of the first two companies to use the verified access API for additional security. Um, Edgerum already mentioned. MDM, AirWatch is one that we've partnered with, but I've done it with Jamf. I've done it with, uh, or will do it later today with a company called Sodi. Uh, the bottom line is it has integration there too. And then web content filtering. So depending on what content filter you have, some of them you can send uh, accounting packets straight to the device itself. Sometimes they may have a listener that's a piece of software. Uh, just all depends, but you can allow that integration. And it's also location aware. So, because who doesn't love quotes, I've got a couple quotes, which full disclosure, uh, this guy, Chris, I know him very well. I helped him set up his cloud path, uh, but he's a solid dude. Um, and he's also a reference if you want to talk to somebody that's not just a corporate shill like myself. Uh, but uh, he just, I'm not going to read it to you. He likes it. Um, they didn't have cloud path originally. Originally, they were using Microsoft's NPS, which is a very worthy radius server. Um, but there's a lot of things that it can't do. Uh, for one example is what's called COA or change of authorization. So one thing that CloudPath can do 
is uh, I'm sure if, if we're all in IT, we've probably had at least one point in our careers the unenviable task of having to let somebody go or the company's letting them go and we have to do our job to make sure they don't have access to network resources. So pretty often you'll see um, like, you know, if somebody's leaving, you just disable their account and they can't get back on potentially depending on how you have your cash uh, credentials and things of that nature. But the nice thing is in cloud path, if you revoke a cert for any reason, it's gonna send a COA out. So not only is it going to revoke the cert, but it's gonna send that change of authorization to that user device and it'll immediately terminate their connection, uh, whether that's wired or wireless, right? So if you're doing a wired side, maybe you flip the port to a black hole VLAN, um, you know, whatever. Uh, if it's Wi-Fi, it's just gonna kick you straight off. So another one, this is a college. Uh, the biggest thing for them was just getting all their users on, making it smooth, making it simple. And that's exactly what they did with CloudPath. So, now the fun part, the demo. Let's see if uh, I don't break something here. I was trying to show an iOS demo earlier and I've been using this thing called Lonely Screen. But of course, right before we start doing the stinking demo, uh, it broke, so sad day. But what I'll do, I'll kind of give you a little poke around here in the Cloud Path GUI and uh, let you kind of see what it looks like. Now again, this is gonna be very abbreviated. Uh, we're running short on time, but if you have any other questions or want more information, just contact Doug or Brandon and I'd be happy to help you with that. So to give you an idea of the configuration, um, got to sign in first. It's always something. So you have these different workflows here, and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, right? You have these different steps that all lead up to an onboard for a user. So for example, it'll let me have the ability to show what the onboard looks like. And so one thing to know, this is what your end user would see. This is just straight out of the box. Other than a couple of little pictures, I haven't really made any changes to this. I know most of you haven't seen me other than my ugly picture earlier, but I don't do pretty. So um, say user comes in, they hit this page, which you can automatically redirect them to. They'll hit start. Then they'll have these different buttons that they can choose. And so, you know, I, it does support visitors as well, uh, Mac off and then our eDPSK, which is proprietary to Ruckus. But they would hit that. Um, just put our password in here. Now this next step is optional. And this would be if you said, okay, in our environment, you can have three devices on the network at one time, or that's all you can have enrolled. So in the case of doing something like that, in my case, I don't have that rule, but let's say, for example, this is my sixth device that I'm going to onboard and I can, I already have five onboarded, but I can only have five devices. So what I have to do here is pick one that I'm going to kick off, right? So you have the ability to control how many they get. And we'll hit continue. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing because if I do, it's going to break the, the webinar here. But basically all they do is they download this, you run it, and it just works, right? It gives them the ability to get onto the network and it's all automated. Uh, it, as long as you can hit OK and next, you're pretty much good to go. Um, so there is, and it, I did want to show a couple of things real quickly, is you have this concept of what we call device configuration. This is what are we going to do to or with that device. And a couple things I wanted to point out. First of all, I'm installing in my home network is just this WLAN for cloud path test. Now, if you're in an environment where perhaps maybe you have more than one uh, SSID you need to onboard uh, the user to, or perhaps maybe you want them to have a certificate for 802.1x authentication on a wired switch, you can add them all here. So when that device onboards, it gets all of those things. So pretty simple and easy. Um, this trust part, this is what are, what's the radius server. In our case, it's going to be CloudPath. The, the radius chain is here, which is the actual PKI that CloudPath has. But one really cool thing that CloudPath can do too, is you can install what we call a web browser trust with the exception of Linux for some reason. But in my case, uh, I'm currently running a Fortinet firewall, um, though soon to uh, migrate to a Sophos box. But what I can do is if I want to do SSL decryption, I can take the root cert off of those box that box or box is, and when those users onboard, I can inject that cert onto their machine or their device, which I don't know if you've ever done SSL inspection before, but didn't have the cert, it just causes all kinds of problems. And getting it out to users can also be very problematic, but you can do it here. And so the OS settings, this is kind of that NAC section I was talking about. So like, for example, on Windows, currently I support all versions of Windows, but let's say I don't want eight or eight one, they were both abominations before God and man. I don't really believe that. I thought they were fine, but nonetheless, if you said, I don't want those, you can set that there. If they try to onboard, it's gonna say your device isn't supported. Please talk to your admin or 
whatever you wanted to say. Also too, very important, you have the ability to set this as a user or a machine profile. Now, I don't see a ton of people doing this. Uh, I do have some users like um, Texas Roadhouse, going back to them, you know, if you've ever eaten at a Texas Roadhouse, a lot of their stores will have those touchscreen kiosks that you can see when you first walk in. You know, you can put it, you know, join the club, put in your, your um, excuse me, some information, including your birthday. And once your birthday comes up, maybe they send you a coupon for a free appetizer or a free drink or something like that, right? Um, in that case, they're actually onboarding those as machines because there isn't a user authenticating per se. They want the machine to authenticate. So you have the ability to do that. It also supports single sign-on. So you can check this box that if it does that, then it will single sign on to other applications that speak that same SSO. And then also has PEEP if you wanted to use, uh, though most often you don't, uh, just for security sake. So let me cancel it here. And in the that setting, now this is where we kind of get into what we call the NAC or light NAC functionality, network access control. So you can put in different kinds of certificate chains. Like if you needed to push out, perhaps you, you have like a BYOC policy but you want to have some kind of management, but you're not going to put them on your domain. Maybe they need your trusted chains. You could still push those out. Here's where you can say, hey, Windows domain needs to be joined or not joined. If it's not joined, but needs to be joined, we can remediate that. Maybe you want to make sure that the Windows update is on or the firewall, et cetera, et cetera. You can also push software if you wish, check for services. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier. Connect a network shared by my contacts can be enabled or disabled. You can disable that for security reasons. And then quite a few other different things that you can set here as well. You can even push out scripts if you wish. But um, you also will have settings for Mac OS, iOS, Android, uh, Chromebooks, Linux. And then finally at this bottom section here, we call it, these are the manually configured OSs. Uh, so for example, like Windows RT, if you remember that when it was here for like a year and a half, and then Blackberries, which I don't see those often, Windows Phone, God rest its soul, and then even the Raspberry Pi, if you want to onboard those on your networks as well. Now, finally, just because I'm running out of time, I apologize, I'm rushing a little bit here, but now we have this BYOD policy template here, which is actually our certificate template. So this is the thing where you can say, hey, how long do I want it to be good for? In my case, it's good for one year. You have many options, right? You could say it's going to die on a specific date, which is very common to education. Um, Sometimes you may see, I had one customer the other day that wanted a 25 year cert. So you have a lot of flexibility on here. This is the OCSP thing I was talking about earlier. In this case, if I don't see a device for 30 days, I'm gonna go ahead and revoke that cert. I can always unrevoke it, but it's there. Um, also, you can lock down what SSID you wanna use it on. Maybe you have one SSID that you want for one thing and maybe something for something else. So you make sure that they can't get on to a different SSID with the same certificate. VLAN IDs. Uh, these are just really radius vendor specific attributes or VSAs if you're familiar with those. Um, we actually have 4,000 different VSAs and you can add your own. Um, this list is not all inclusive. It just because it'd be really stinking long if it was. But so for example, if you use Rucka switches, which were brocade, which were foundry, you'll see a bunch of foundry commands in here. Um, you will also see a bunch of ruckus uh, VSAs as well to do all kinds of different things. So, um, Again, not too super deep, that's it on that side. One thing I did wanna show you, I do have a short video. Um, it's been asked pretty often, like what does it look like to actually onboard a device? What's that user experience look like? So this is just about a one minute video that shows you the process of onboarding an Android device. You will notice that there is an app that is downloaded. It's actually on the phone for this demo. Uh, you do need to have that because of the way that Android handles certificates. But uh, nonetheless, here's just a quick demo of that. Sorry, Abby types really slow. So now this is actually open the Cloud Path app. And just so you know, this is exactly what the app looks like on Windows and Mac OS as well. iOS doesn't have an app. Uh, that's actually what I was gonna show you. It's actually a profile, but since my uh, lonely screen appears to be broken, can't do that. But uh, again, we wanna demo later when I figure out why this thing gets not working, I'd be happy to show you. So at the end of the day, the couple of things that happened here, 
um, not only did it go and onboard the device, which may have been on a different SSID, say like an open SSID called start here or onboard or what have you. Um, that's how they get to this page. It automatically forwards it, them to it to go to what I was kind of showing you earlier. And then once it gets the config, the Cloud Path app will not only create that profile on the device for the user, it will also automatically move them to the correct network. You can also set it to that it will forget that open network just because I know I've had customers in the past that have gone through and got on the open uh, or got on the secure network, but for some reason they went back to the open and then they can't go anywhere because it's just blocked. It's just basically to get you on the network. So you can actually tell CloudPath to tell the device to forget that network so you don't run into that issue. So with that, um, I guess we'll just, we'll call it good on that side. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, I wanna say uh, thanks to, to Doug and the guys over there for having me today. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I know we got a few more minutes left. Are there any questions? Uh, you can put them in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask me as well, or Doug or Brandon. So Greg, what bars have you been bounced out of? Um, I'm sworn to secrecy on that. I have pending litigation. <laughs> no, I did one time try to go to a show. Uh -oh. I find humor. Oh, yeah. You, as you started that statement, you kind of faded out into space and then you came back, I think, at the end of your last word. Oh, it wasn't funny, so I'll just spare you. <laughs> <laughs> Re retracted. Yeah. Strike that from the record, Your Honor. Right. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Greg, um, for putting on the CloudPath presentation for us today. Hopefully it was helpful for everyone in attendance. Uh, we will be, this was recorded today, um, so we will be um, reviewing that and pulling it out uh, to redistribute at some point. So um, any questions that anyone has that we can get out or get back to you guys right now? Let me see. I don't, I, just, I don't see anything right now that was left unanswered. So um, why don't we just go ahead and wrap it up then? Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, hopefully this is uh, what you what you came to hear and, and learn. Um, if there's anything else that we could do going forward that you're that you would be interested in hearing about um, any technology that we've provided, any ruckus technology, you know we're we're pretty close with the ruckus guys and, and Greg himself, so um, we can put that together for you. Any of the other technologies, and then as mentioned going forward, we have a three part series going forward um, where every three months, well, it's not every three months, it's uh, the series will start and it takes three months and we'll be doing three different parts, a meetup, a webinar and a lunch and learn. Um, <clears throat> so look forward to um, the next uh, distributions of, of those invites and information coming about that. Um, uh, do we have a date for the next one? Uh, I think it starts in September though, right? Yeah, so, so that, it's, it's every month from here going forward. Um, and then the series lasts for three months. So anyway, um, let us know We're we're here to do this for you guys and hopefully, you know, keep you guys abreast of, of the latest technology and anything that we should be doing and changing and or not doing. So, uh, Greg, great job and appreciate your time and efforts and everything. Um, I'll let you know if you have any other questions. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, everybody. Uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye now.